everybody. Good morning. Happy day of worship. I am so excited to be here and to worship with you all this morning, as always, but feeling a little extra excited this morning. Um, yeah, we are looking forward to a day of three different speakers, some different interactive activities, um, and a whole lot of worship. So we are excited to engage in that with you this morning. And Sam is going to read for us a call to worship from Psalms before we get started. All right, this is Psalm 105. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, proclaim his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him praise, sing praise to him. Tell about all his wondrous works, boast in his holy name. Let the hearts of all who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face always. Remember his wondrous works that he has done, his wonders, the judgments he has pronounced. You offspring of Abraham, his servants, Jacob's descendants, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments govern the whole earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The promise he ordained for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham. I mean, that's why we're, we're gathered here. We're gathered here because we know who God is and we want to give thanks to him and we want to praise him. So would you stand as we sing our first song, I Thank God. Let's, let's have a little fun this morning. Where'd my kit go? Just me. choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind so long to my old friends burdened in bitterness you can just keep it moving now you ain't welcome here and now till I walk the streets of gold I'll see you back another one.
morning, Grace. Welcome to Spring Day of Worship 2022. Go ahead and have a seat. My name is Kyle Brennan, and I serve as the chapel band director here, and it is my privilege to introduce our morning a little bit here. So this morning, we are going to continue what we've been looking at all year, looking at what Jesus has done for us, like we, what we just sang, right? Thanking Jesus for what he's done for us, and then looking at what does it mean then to follow him. What does it mean to follow him? So we're going to continue looking at the book of Matthew to try to answer that question. What does it look like to follow Jesus? What does it mean to have every aspect of my life in line with following after God? And this perfectly aligns with what chapel's purpose is, to learn to integrate our faith into every aspect of our lives. So this morning, we hope that it will be a real encouragement and challenge in that direction, integrating our faith into every aspect of our lives. And, and we're going to do that this morning by looking at one passage in the book of Matthew. Matthew 22, starting in verse 34. Now, this is where Jesus has one of his great answers to a question. All right? Here's what it says. Matthew 22, starting in verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus, the only one to ever live the sinless life, says, you want to keep the whole law? You want to follow me in living out what it means to truly trust and follow God? The whole law hangs on this. Every You want to you do that? Do this and it will, and the rest will take care of itself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So this morning, those are the three things we're going to look at. Loving the Lord your God with your heart and soul, with, your, with our minds, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. We'll be, we'll be singing together a bunch. We'll hear from three great teachers, and we'll have some activities. You got the bags on your way in. If you didn't get a bag on your way in, pop back up to uh, either, either entrance, and you can, you can grab one of those. But hopefully, like, all of this will lead us to help apply this in loving God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. So let me pray for us as we get started this morning, and then I'll introduce our first speaker. God, we thank you. We thank you for a chance to slow down and spend a morning looking at the ultimate thing that you've called us to, which is loving you with all that we are, and loving those around us. God, it's something that can be so easy to say and yet so practically challenging to live out. So God, give us a deeper understanding of, of what that means this morning and stir in our hearts a deeper love for you. God, by looking at your word, by looking at, at Jesus and what he's done for us, by looking at, by, by worshiping you, responding in worship, God, stir our hearts to greater love of you. Show itself in how we love those around us. God, come and move here today. You know it's something you love to do, but do your work in us. We thank you for Jesus and his immense love for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, our first speaker this morning is Pastor Ray Chang. He was born in Chicago land and has lived all around the world, including Hawaii. Los Angeles, China, South Korea, Guatemala, Spain, and Panama, where he served in the Peace Corps. As you may be able to tell from that list, he is an avid traveler and has visited more than 50 countries throughout the world. Prior to entering uh, vocational ministry, Ray worked in both uh, for-profit and not-for-profit, and he, uh, excuse me, he also served as, uh, on the pastoral staff at the Orchard Evangelical Free Church prior to his current role. Currently, he is in the chaplain's office at Wheaton College, overseeing their discipleship efforts. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Communications from Wheaton College, a Master's of Divinity from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and is currently pursuing a PhD in higher education from Azusa Pacific University. He is happily married to Jessica, who currently serves as the Associate Vice President of Advancement and University Relations at Trinity International University in Deerfield, Illinois. Guys, I'm looking forward to hearing from this man. I've, I've seen his, some of his work. I've heard from him before, and we are in for a wonderful challenge of hearing about how God calls us to love. So please 
help me welcome Ray Chang. Good morning, everyone. How are y'all? A little too early still. Let me stand up and, and, and stretch before we get into God's word. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to be here. I always love my time uh, here with you. Uh, the last time I was here uh, was the first chapel that got shut down during the pandemic. And so I arrived the night before, uh, having had spoken in uh, at Cornerstone University uh, in the state over uh, in Michigan, and then uh, found out that, uh, that everything was shutting down here. And so I uh, missed uh, seeing you, uh, seeing your faces, worshiping with you, uh, but really gl- glad and grateful to be here. I- I'm sad to hear that Brent is, is sick, so I keep him in the prayers throughout the day. Uh, let's hope that he gets better. Um, because he was supposed to come out yesterday, but he didn't, and so it was a little less fun without him. Um, and and I uh, and I'm really excited that uh, we get to spend some time. I do want to say uh, how uh, blessed you are. I just want to remind you how blessed you are to be able to worship like this. There are people all over the country that wish for a day of worship. That they would do anything to be in the seats that you're in right now to have classes canceled so that you can just focus on singing uh, songs of worship to God and hearing from the word of God. And I hope that you take advantage of uh, this day that's been set apart uh, to, to break rhythms and to, and to really uh, set your mind and your heart uh, uh, and orient them towards God. Um, I do also want to say uh, that you have some amazing staff here, uh, especially uh, people like Brent and uh, Aaron uh, Crabtree and Leticia and uh, many wonderful faculty members and Jacqueline. And so I, I let, let them know they're doing a good job, uh, especially because it's, it's as, as exhausting as it has been for you, uh, it's been as exhausting for uh, them and pretty much everyone else uh, who works in uh, higher education in this church and beyond. And so uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, really glad to worship together. And we're, we're going to dive right into uh, God's word in our time together. Do you love me? Imagine if God asked you this. Are you able to imagine that? What would you say? How would you answer him? Well, this is the question that Jesus asked Peter as he appeared to him after the resurrection. After experiencing zero luck fishing, someone calls out to Peter from the shore, ordering Peter and some of the other disciples to cast out their nets. And then after they do and catch a boatload of fish, Peter realizes who it was. It was Jesus. It was the resurrected Jesus. So Peter jumps out the boat, runs towards the shore, wades towards the shore, and makes his way to him. Then they share a meal together. And after sharing the meal, Jesus turns to Peter and asks him, do you love me? Those of us who consider ourselves Christian really ought to reflect on this question on a regular basis. If Jesus were to ask you this, what would your honest answer be? Take a a few seconds to reflect on that. What would your honest answer be if Jesus asked you, do you love me? Would you be able to tell him yes? Would you tell him no? Would you try to search for the option that says it's complicated? Well, this question, uh, the question of our love for God is the question our passage presents to us today. Uh, as, As it was read in Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40, we read what is known as the Great Commandment. Referenced in three of the four Gospels accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see Jesus summarize the law into two primary commandments. 
they were the good disciples. They were like Jesus type followers of Sadducees. The Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with a question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. So I was charged this morning with the task of preaching on what it means to love, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. That means I have the benefit of preaching before Logan, who is a peer of yours and will deliver a wonderful uh, gospel-centered, biblically-rich sermon. Uh, and and I, I'm glad I get to do that before him. But before we dive in, I, I do want to make sure that we are on the same page of what's happening here in our passage today. I, I want to make sure that we set the stage for the entirety of our time and likely our day together. Uh, upon entering Jerusalem on what we now know as Palm Sunday, which we just celebrated, the focus turns to Jesus' authority and identity as the long-awaited Messiah. Matthew zooms into the person and the authority of Jesus Christ, making sure that everyone who reads his account would know exactly what is at stake here. There is no confusion to the reader about what is being communicated as Matthew turns up the heat on the messianic identity of Christ. Either Jesus is who he says he is, or he isn't. And through a series of events from Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem on a donkey, uh, to the incident where Jesus overturns uh, the tables of those who turn the house of worship into a den of robbers by essentially pricing out the poor from being able to afford sacrificial offerings. And the moment Jesus curses a fig tree for not bearing fruit, the authority of Jesus becomes the primary focus of the passage. Then he shifts our attention to the chief priests and elders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, as they confront Jesus, seeking to corner and to trap him by making him say something that would lead to his demise. Back and forth, they try to get Jesus in trouble by asking him gotcha questions. But they fail. Instead, in both accounts, they're shunned and stumped by his answers. Jesus literally owned them. He owned them all. You guys still say that? Owned? That was a big word like 10 years ago. That's like too old now. But then he's confronted by another Pharisee described as an expert in the law who had a question that would for sure get Jesus in trouble. They knew how Jesus answered the other two questions. They, they, they saw how Jesus seemed to operate. And so they sent forth their Goliath to finally corner him and get him into trouble. Question? Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? See, at first glance, this question seems innocent enough. With 613 commandments in the Torah that's laid out for people, it seems like a sincere and reasonable question. But if you take a look at the broader context that this question was asked in, the, the reason this question was so controversial was that different groups within the religious sect emphasized different commandments and different sets of commandments. They each believed that commandments that they emphasized were actually the most important commandments. And it's, it's kind of like how Christians today who... Uh, who are trying to separate the work of evangelism and social action or social justice, uh, erasing one as they emphasize the other, seem to be at odds with each other. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were sort of like that. Uh, but the theologian Rene Padilla uh, describes evangelism and social action as two wings of a plane. And it spoke about how a plane could not fly without either wing. And he did so because he saw a divide in the body of Christ, much like we see today, 
where one group emphasizes one at the expense of the other instead of emphasizing both and lose the entire plane as a result. You can't be faithful without evangelism and social justice, declaration and demonstration. The one without the other is incomplete. And anyone who says otherwise is trying to get you to ride on a plane that they are piloting with only one wing. In a similar way, this was a tension that was felt between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If what Jesus said didn't fit neatly within one theological camp or another, it would ensure that he would upset and likely incite an entire group of religious leaders or everyone altogether against him. But Jesus didn't fall into that trap. Like he did with the other questions, which you ought to look into at some point, he answers the question in a way that no one could deny. Instead of highlighting one command over another, he hones in on two overarching commands, which animate all the others, both emerging within the Torah itself. The first is from Deuteronomy 6.5, which is known as the Shema, where it's written, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. The second comes from Leviticus 19.18, where it's written, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. In both counts, he elevates the discussion beyond selecting one set of rules and regulations over another and prioritizes the principle of love, which could be applied into every aspect of religious and communal life. Emphasizing these two commands also binds together the love of God with the love of neighbor, stating that the driving force of faith is an obedience motivated by love towards God and neighbor. Love of God and love of neighbor, then, is the primary duty of the one who obeys God. It's worth noting that it's through an attempt to actually corner and trap Jesus that we're given one of the most beautiful summaries of the law of God. In what one religious leader meant for evil, God brought forth good through the most concentrated and beautiful summation God draws. Love God, love neighbor. Which brings us to our theme for this morning. Love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul. Now it's important to note that Matthew's account states that the greatest command is to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Mark and Luke add the word strength to the mix, which is actually the word that was used in Deuteronomy. But for whatever reason, Matthew switches out strength for mind, focusing on what takes place internally in the life of his disciples. But in all three accounts, Jesus basically says, true love of God demands all of you, not just parts of you. And if you really want to love God, you must bring your entire being. You must give him your entire being. For the sake of our time together, as I mentioned, we're going to be focusing on what it means to love God with all of our heart and with all of our soul. Now, in the Greek and Hebrew, the, the heart is always meant the central command center of your life. The, the heart is where motivation and movement meet. Rarely when it is mentioned throughout Scripture does the heart actually refer to the physical heart or the organ that beats inside of your chest. Instead, it refers to the deep place within us where our desires and our decisions collide. To love God with all of your heart means to make him the ultimate object of your greatest and deepest desires, which drives all of the decisions in your life. The soul is similar. To love God with all your soul is to love him with the whole of your personhood. It's to love him with the very breath of life within you. Your soul encompasses the whole of your personality, enlivened by the breath of God, whose affections ought to be directed towards God. In other words, it's to place your identity primarily and wholly in Christ. It's essentially to submit the whole of your person to the Lord. 
I wonder how many of you would say that you love God in this way. I wonder if those of you in here who identify as Christian actually love him in the ways that we are called to love him. My sense is, if you're anything like me, which because we're all human, we kind of have some similarities, who wants to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, with the whole of my being, we'll find ourselves falling terribly short. Instead of loving God, competing love lies to the surface. Instead of being enamored by God's grace, I find myself distracted by cheap and impermanent desires. This isn't surprising as the world, the devil, and the flesh seem to be implacable enemies of the soul, as Thomas Aquinas described. They're they're constantly trying to derail our love for God and direct our love to something else, to anything else. And as a result, we are constantly manufacturing and moving towards idols that demand the position in our lives that only God deserves. John Calvin wrote that the human heart is a perpetual idol factory. He writes, man and woman's mind, full as it is of pride and boldness, dares to imagine a God according to its own capacity. As it sluggishly plods, indeed it is overwhelmed with the crassest ignorance. It conceives an unreality and an empty appearance of God. To these evils, a new wickedness joins itself. That person tries to express in his work the sort of God he has inwardly conceived. Therefore, the mind becomes an idol. The hand gives the birth. What this means is that Sin disorients us in, a, in ways that lead us to disorder our love. Though we want to love God, sin places detours in order to distract our hearts and souls away from God. Augustine wrote that sin has made us incurvatus in se, or curved into ourselves. Martin Luther expounded on this by writing, Our nature, by the corruption of the first sin, being so deeply curved in on itself that it not only bends the best gifts of God towards itself and enjoys them as is plain in the works righteous and hypocrite, or rather even uses God himself in order to attain these gifts, but it also fails to realize that it so wickedly, curvedly, and viciously seeks all things, even God, for its own sake. Scripture describes humanity as so curved into and upon ourselves that we not only use that we use not only physical but even spiritual goods for our own purposes and in all things seek only ourselves. What this means is that we are so sinful that we have found a way make ourselves the center of the universe. We found a way to make everything about us. And to even turn good things into God in our lives. This is why Tim Keller writes that most idols are good things that are made ultimate. When we think of idols, we often think of things that are tied to spiritual power that are in direct opposition to the true and living God. Many people think of idols as inanimate objects or statues that, that people bow before. But the Bible describes idols far more expansively than that. Idols are anything that takes the place of God in our lives. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, if we ask how we are to know where our hearts are, the answer is simple. Everything which hinders us from loving God above all things and acts as a barrier between ourselves and our obedience to Jesus is our treasure and the place where our heart is. This means that anything can become an idol. This means that you can turn anything into an idol. The cell phone in your pocket to the clothes you wear, how you look to how you are perceived, your grades and your ability to compete, your hopes and your dreams, and pretty much anything else 
in your life and in this world can become an idol. Your friendships and your relationships can be as much an idol as fame and fortune can be. So can your desire to be married, a vision for your lifestyle to be a particular way, the need to attain a particular type of success, the need to be needed, as well as your political and your ideological views and your commitments. Idols are anything that you elevate to the level of God. They're anything you equate to God that's not essential to God. And they're anything that's considered more important to you than God. I have a friend who's a therapist in California. Uh, she uh, actually shared, uh, she and I were having a conversation a few years ago, and she shared that most people think of infidelity in marriage as merely engaging in inappropriate relationships or inappropriate physical relations outside of the marriage covenant. She then shared a definition of infidelity that I found extremely helpful and even convicting. She said that infidelity in marriage is simply a shift in priorities, which leads to a breach of trust. Shift in priorities, which leads to a breach of trust. Here's why this is so powerful. It means that fidelity in marriage is not limited to whether you sleep with someone you should not be sleeping with, but begin to wonder what it would be like to be with someone else to be with someone better, to be with someone novel. Not only that, infidelity could also mean that you place other things before your marriage, like work, your hobbies, your own personal preferences, and so on. Infidelity in marriage is a shift in priorities. Uh, this made so much sense to me because the couples that I counsel where their marriages run dry aren't always marriages where one spouse cheated on the other, Instead, it's, it's a marriage where one spouse or both spouses slowly but surely began to prioritize other things, including good and important things, above the person they vowed to love until death do them part. To be unfaithful means to shift your priorities to other things. To be idolatrous means to shift your priorities to other things. This is at the heart of idolatry which is loving something else more than you love God. Idols are the things that capture your affection and your heart's attention and edge out God in the process. Again, they're anything that take the place that rightfully belongs to God. But there are also idols beneath idols. Most people know that fame and fortune can be idols, but almost always people pursue them because of a deeper idol. And I really love what Keller says about this. Keller writes about four primary idols that reside beneath every other idol. Power, control, comfort, and approval. These are the idols that drive us towards every other idol. When we don't find these things in God and receive these things and, and, don't, and, and don't receive these things from God, these are the idols that take over as we curve into ourselves. Keller writes, some people are strongly motivated by influence and power, while others are motivated by approval or appreciation. Some want emotional and physical comfort more than anything else. Others want security and the control over their environment. People with a deep idol of power do not mind being unpopular in order to gain influence, but people who are the most motivated by approval are the opposite. They gladly lose power and control as long as everyone thinks well of them. Each deep idol, power, approval, comfort, and control, generates a different set of hopes and fears. Surface idols are things like money, spouse, children, accolades, through which our deep idols seek fulfillment. We want to be TikTok famous for a variety of reasons. But we're often superficial in our analysis of our idol structures. For example, money can be a surface idol that, that comes to satisfy more foundational influences. Some people want lots of money as a way to control their world and life. 
And such people don't usually spend much money, and they live very modestly. They keep it all safely saved and invested so they can feel completely safe in the world. Others want money for access to social circles and to make them beautiful and attractive. These people spend their money on lavish on themselves in lavish ways. Other people want money because it gives them so much power over others. In every case, money functions as an idol, and yet because of the various deeper idols, it results in very different patterns of behavior. The person using money to serve a deep idol of control will often feel superior to others and use money to obtain power or social approval. In every case, however, money idolatry inflames and distorts lives, especially when it's driven by deeper idols. Here's what this means. This means that anything we think we need to have that we can't live without and that we absolutely must attain often emerges from a deeper drive often rooted in a desire for power, control, comfort, and approval. When these things are not fulfilled and found in God himself, they drive us away from God often leading us to find us still in lesser things. C.S. Lewis said it like this, our desires are not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We jump from one thing to another in hopes that if we just get enough of it, we'll find fulfillment only to realize that we are like children who stuff ourselves full of Halloween candy and find ourselves miserable and unsatisfied. The more we get of the things that cannot ultimately fill the God-sized hole in our hearts, the emptier we seem to feel. God has made you and made me for himself. And our ultimate fulfillment and satisfaction can only come from him. This is why Augustine wrote, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. This is what it means to love God with all your heart and all your soul. It's, it's to place him at the center of your life and orient your life around him. It means to prioritize him above all others. It's to go all in on God and to know that there is nothing or no one else greater than him. It's to fully trust and rest in him, with your deepest insecurities and your deepest anxieties. At this point, it would be natural to feel a little encouraged and discouraged. It's natural to feel both encouraged and discouraged. You ought to be encouraged in that you're, you actually know the living God who can satisfy, fill, and Fulfill your heart in ways that nothing else can. You might be discouraged in that if you're honest with yourself, you know that your love for God is not as we have been talking about today. If this is you, there is good news for you. When Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? He knew that Peter was carrying around a a deep shame guilt. You see, right before Jesus was crucified, Jesus told Peter that he would deny him three times before the rooster crows. Y'all know that story? Peter adamantly disagreed, saying that he would never deny Jesus. But then when the rooster crowed, Peter realized that he denied Jesus three times. Different accounts to hit him deeply, so deeply that he wept bitterly. That's what scripture tells us. And when Jesus asked Peter, Do you love me? Three times he asked him, Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times he repeated, Do you love me? Jesus. 
Jesus was actively referring to Peter. From the guilt and shame he carried from denying Jesus as king, he would never deny him. God initiated with Peter the first time that they met, and then initiated with her again after Peter betrayed him. This is the love of God. And I wonder if some of you in here relate with Peter. Some of you made promises to God that you would never forsake him or betray him, that you would never deny him or turn your back on him, that he would always be first in your life. You, you made promises that he had the whole of your life. But as you got older, decisions were made, and you have drifted away from your first love. Your, your faith is lukewarm at best, and you have no idea or intention to ever, you have no idea if you will ever or intention of ever going back. Others of you are living a double life. On the outside, you appear to be a model Christian. You're serving all over campus. You're active in your church. But behind closed doors, you're doing things you ought not to be doing, saying things you ought not to be saying, thinking things you ought not to be thinking, and continuing to go deeper and deeper into those things. You feel the weight of hypocrisy bearing on your soul, but your conscience is also getting seared. You feel like you have to maintain the image that you've projected out into the world. Who you are on the outside, not who you are on the inside. Still others of you are wanting to want God, but you just can't seem to muster up the love that seems to be required of you. You know you should love God, but it just doesn't seem to be there. You don't know if you actually do want to cry out to serve Jesus or not, if you really want to give Jesus everything. Maybe some of you are like, I have to be done with everything right now. You want to be a Christian, others of you. Want to grow in your faith, maybe. But it seems like you're spinning your tires in the mud, stuck capable of going deep in your walk with God. You want to want God, but the passion is what's really there. Does any of these sound familiar? Where is good news for you? As we see in the case of Peter, it's God who is constantly in pursuit of us. His love for Peter transform Peter's life in a way that cemented Peter's love for him. In the same way, it's, it's the love of God that's the source of our love for him. God's love generates our love for him. It is God's love that led Peter to boldly declare that he would follow Jesus to the grave. And God's love that after Peter betrayed and denied Jesus three times, that would actually lead Peter to love him to the point that he would be crucified upside down because of his faith in Jesus Christ. We can only love God because he first loved us. Our love for God rests on his love for us. And though we would like to believe that, our, we, that we love God on our own strength and out of our own uh, energy and, and, and merit, it's only because of God's love for us that we are able to love him at all. The reason we love God is because God himself loves us, and our love for him is only and always a response to his love for us. Dr. E.B. Hill was a longtime pastor of Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Los Angeles and one of the most prominent preachers in the entire country, very much like the late E.K. Bailey. You guys know who E.K. Bailey is? If you don't know who he is, I strongly encourage you to ask Sokisha. Uh, when Dr. Hill was a young man, he married Jane Edna Caruthers, a, a young woman from a very aristocratic family. By his own account, her willingness to marry him raised many eyebrows because she came from Upishing, 
and he grew up with nothing. He grew up in poverty. A few months into the marriage, Evie Hill convinced Jane that they should actually invest in a gas station, a service station. Jane warned him that she didn't have the knowledge or the time to run the business and tried to steer him away from it and that they would likely lose everything if he did. He persuaded her otherwise, but over time, she was proven right. And the day eventually came for him to tell her that he had lost the business and their entire investment in it, leading to deep shame and difficult times. But her response was quite unexpected. She was in her room, and he'd gotten in, comes out of the room, and she says, you know, I'm in the business of figuring out. I figured that you don't smoke or drink. If you had been a smoker and a drinker, we w- you would have lost that much money anyway. So I figure it's six of one and half a dozen of another. Let's just forget about it. We moved on. With those words, he knew that she was saying, I love you. I still believe in you. And I'm with you to the end. Let's get through this together. A few weeks later, Evie Hill came home to discover that Jane had prepared a lovely candlelight dinner, thinking that this would be a romantic evening together. He, he made a humorous remark as he went to the bathroom to wash his hands. When he flipped on the light switch, nothing happened. Then he went to the bathroom, or then he went to the bedroom, where he flipped on the light switch, and again, nothing happened. Then he realized why he had flipped the candle on. When he sat down at the table, full of grief and shame, she started crying. And then she said, I know you've been working hard, but I didn't want to add any more burden on you. And we didn't have any money to pay the electric bill, so they turned off the electricity. So I thought we would have a nice candlelight dinner together. Dr. Hill spoke at his his wife's own funeral, and reflecting on her, response at the funeral, he said that he, is, he was the man that he became and that any success, success that he had received, achieved was precisely because uh, of her love for him. He said that you could have broken me. You could have shamed me. You could have destroyed me. You could have put me down. You could have said that she's never been in a situation like the one I put her in and how I failed her by putting me to shame for years. But she didn't. Instead, she said, let's eat by candlelight. Let's let him know that she loved him, that she was with him, and that she believed in him even after he had fallen so terribly ill in his last moments. The way that Dr. Hill's wife met him in his failure So does God meet us in ours. But instead of inviting us to merely dine with him by candlelight, God illuminates his love for us through the light of the world, through the life, death, and resurrection of his son Jesus, and ensuing kingdom to come. You can love God with all of your heart and with all of your soul because he first loved you. This is the good news for you and me to hold on to today, that that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us so that we might live in eternity with God forever. Amen? Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for this time. We thank you that you remind us of your love for us and how your love animates any love that we have for you. We pray that we would see you more clearly, behold the beauty of Christ in our lives, and see how you are present with us in our times of need. We pray that that would be the thing that transforms us in this world. We pray this 
Thank you, Ray, so much for speaking this morning. Um, that's what we want to take a couple minutes to reflect on is exactly what we were just hearing about is loving God with all of our heart and with all of our soul. And as we heard from our speaker, um, we're called to commit every part of ourselves to God. And every single thing we think about, every single thing we do, every single thing we say is supposed to be a reflection of the love that God has showed us. But that can be a little overwhelming. So we're going to take a little time to reflect on a specific way that we can love God with our heart and our soul. So Matthew 12, 34, specifically the second half of the verse, Jesus says, For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. That's Christian standard Bible. Um, for the mouth, from the mouth <coughs> speaks from the overflow of the heart. So basically what Jesus is saying is whatever we say, whether to ourselves, whether to other people, whether about other people, that's just coming straight from our heart. Similar to what Ray was saying, what we find ourselves talking about most consistently can reveal what our idols are. So what is most important to you is what's going to come out of your mouth. Or another way to say it, our words are a great thermometer of where our hearts are at. So we're going to throw some questions on the screen, uh, similar to Midnight Chapel, and give you guys a couple minutes to just discuss these uh, with the people around you. Discuss how, you're, how you speak, what, what your words are like, if they're God-honoring, if they're not. Just pick a question or two, go through all of them if you can, but whatever sticks out to you, don't feel rushed. Don't feel you have to get through all of them exactly, but find one that stick out to you and discuss with the people around you how your words can honor God. All right, thank you.
as we're starting to kind of come out of this discussion time, I don't want to cut anybody off, um, but we're going to move into another segment of musical worship, and um, this next song that we're going to sing, you might know it, you might not, I don't know, um, it's called Out of Hiding, or Father's Song, and um, this song is basically written as if it were written from the Lord's perspective and um, recognizing his heart toward us. And um, as we were just talking about, we we love God because he first loved us. And it is in response to understanding his perfect love that we have the opportunity to turn our affections toward him. Um, so, yeah, um, feel free to jump in and sing along. Um, you're welcome to stand or sit or whatever is um, most comfortable and worshipful for you. Um, yeah, feel free to jump in and sing or just to sit and let the words um, wash over you as we enter into this. There's no need to cover what I already see. You've got your reasons, but I hold the real truth. You've been on lockdown, and I hold the key. As I
Jesus had a way. I open up my heart to you now. I open up my heart to you now. So do what only Jesus had.
our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to bear everything to God in prayer. And oh, what peace we often forfeit. And oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not care. Snows are Let's go for him now. Lord, we are so grateful that you are here. We can call you friend. We can, we can um, name ourselves children of God. Uh, we are loved so perfectly and completely. Um, I do pray that as we reflect on that today, that it would get deeper and deeper and deeper into our hearts. And it's only you who can do that. Through your spirit, would you transform us into people who live out of the fact that we are loved perfectly and fully and completely. Um, we need you so much, Lord, so would you be with us in your name. Amen. Amen. So I also have the privilege to welcome our second speaker of the day. Uh, 
He is an RA of Indy Tube uh, guy side. Uh, I met him last year. He's from the legendary city of Las Vegas, which around here pretty much automatically makes you a legend. Uh, he was my Smash Bros training partner for the Joust tournament last year, an unofficial roommate to my room uh, because he always wanted to play my Switch. Uh, he's also an MDiv major and just a fantastic, fantastic guy. Uh, very charismatic. You guys will love to hear from him. So welcome with me to the stage, Logan Ringgold. Thank you. Oh, man. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, like you said, uh, my name is Logan Ringgold. And, uh, t <laughs> uh, and today I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the second focus of... Um, these verses, how to love God with all your mind. Um, and I think it's crucial to take a moment of reflection, right? Um, when was the last time that you loved God with all your mind? Um, I know for me, uh, it was the story about how I came to grace. Um, but to know that, you're going to need the background. And so um, it was the summer of my sophomore year, going into my junior year. I went to this thing called CIY, uh, Christ in Youth. Um, it's amazing, <laughs> um, really life-changing. And so um, a bunch of churches go to um, Biola University in California, and just really good scripture, getting into the, into the word, getting, like, quality uh, worship. And so um, that last night we were there, that Friday night, we had um, an altar call, and uh, he was like, the speaker, he asked if you felt like God was calling you into ministry um, to stand up. And I felt that, um, I just felt uh, uh, urge to stand up. I felt compelled to stand up. And so I did. And he had everyone pray over the people who stood up. And it was just phenomenal. And fast forward to, to senior year, um, we had to go and I had to go apply for colleges. I didn't know where I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. At first, I wanted to be a chef. I like eating, bro. You can tell. Um, but <laughs> I like eating. But um, I, can't, I can't be a chef. I was like, maybe a scientist, something like that. Couldn't be me. My sister, she's the, she's the chemistry nerd. And so um, I was like, what do I do? Where do I go? Uh, I, I looked at Taylor. I was like, I, I don't know. And then this guy named Lonnie Anderson, uh, he reached, yeah, he's awesome, phenomenal. He um, is a pastor in Kokomo, and he reached, he's also childhood friends with my mom, and he reached out to her, and he was like, hey, your son, he's applying for colleges, tell him to come look at Grace. Um, and I was like, if God wants to use me here, uh, I'll get in, I'll do something, like God wants me there for a reason, and so I got accepted into Grace, I'm here now, and I just, just love my time here. And in preparing this message, I realized that the reality is, is that the world is fighting for our attention, the attention of our mind. But the mind isn't just thoughts, but it's what we, put, but what we put into it, and what we devote our minds to. And so you may be thinking, how Logan, how do we love God with all of our mind? How, what does that look like? And so I have two ways on how we can love God with all of our mind. The first way is that we must set our minds on the things above, and the second way is that we must renew our mind. I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to dive into it. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, yeah, I just pray that, that you use me as a vessel, that you speak through me, that, you, <laughs> that I speak efficiently and effectively, that I preach your word. I just rest in that truth, and I pray that we open our hearts and minds to what I have to say. In the name of our prayer and say, amen. Okay, let's get into it. So the first, like I said, the first way on how we can love God with all of our mind is to set our mind on the things above. Colossians 3.2 says, set your minds on the things that are above and not on the things that are on earth. And so I was like, what does that mean? I need some, some background on that. And so one source that I found, it says to set one's mind on something is to choose to think about it influencing one's goals, and guiding one's course of action. And I think that's very important because just because we're Christians and we live in the world doesn't mean that we have to look like the world. Um, if we are to set our minds on the things of heaven, 
then we have to unplug ourselves from the things of the world. And I know for some, it's a big misunderstanding uh, that uh, college students um, that are uh, college students, that Christianity isn't cool. It's a big misunderstanding. Um, I know for me, uh, I thought it was cringy. I thought that people, um, yeah, I was just so plugged into the world that Christianity, uh, con- Christian content creators and things weren't, weren't really, it didn't seem genuine to me. It felt fake. Um, but then I came to the realization that I'm hating on my brothers and sisters who are also trying to show Jesus love. And uh, I, I realized that I was um, too plugged into the world, that I was disconnected from God and his people. And so um, I even went as far as seeking other people's opinions of me instead of God's truth, God's <laughs> everlasting truth. I was seeking the approval from culture over the creator. And I think an important part of setting our minds on the things of heaven is feeding our minds to things that point us towards God, whether that's reading and meditating on God's word or listening to a good worship song, talking with a friend over coffee because you know you have a good friend when uh, they hold you accountable, reading things that draw us closer to God. So let's stop and think about this. In the past week, the past month, the past session, what songs, shows, and movies um, have you listened to or watched? Let's even turn it up a notch, right? What posts have you been interacting with on social media? And while putting this together, I reflected and realized that God had been working with me on this. Before this talk today, if you would ask me what my top genre of music was on Spotify, uh, Christianity or gospel music would probably be around fifth on the list. And I, I just recently realized that the music I was listening to had negative effects on on my mentality, on on my speech, my actions. Um, And I felt like it was harming my relationship with God. I think that music is a great thing. God gave us tools to listen. We have tools to make it, to worship him. Um, So I listened to the words of Alan Carr. He's this uh, guy on YouTube who does online ministry. He says, when we have a song we like, we play it over and over again. Why? Because that song invokes some kind of feeling or emotion in us. We want to experience that high over and over again. So we play those songs again and again, and they get into our spirit, they get into our mind, they get into our thinking, and the more we take in the message of that song, we can ultimately start to believe the lyrics that are in those songs and live our lives accordingly. I just felt convicted that the music I was listening to put a wall between my relationship with God. I knew that he was on the other side, but I chose not to actually pursue him. I felt like it kept me from uh, keeping my mind on the things above. Fast forward to the conversation I had with my mom. Mama Ringgold the goat. And she's, she's a legend. Um, and I had, this, I had this prayer journal I saw on Instagram called the Daily Kairos. Um, which is daily bread. Uh, something along the lines of that. And I was like, ah, am I going to buy it? Should I invest in it? Is it something that I'm just going to buy and look at? Is it something I'm going to buy and and actually use? Um, And my mother was like, you should treat yourself. You you deserve it. If you want it, go for it. Um, So I did buy it for two reasons. I wanted something where I could spend intentional time with God so that I could wake up and prioritize my relationship with God. So many times that I find myself waking up, scrolling on my phone, TikTok, Instagram, whatever the case may be, Um, But the second reason is because my mother modeled quiet time for me. She made the intentional choice to set her mind on the things above. And it's just been so encouraging to see her wake up every morning, make her coffee. She has to have her coffee. Or else, yeah, quiet time is not happening. Uh, So (laughs) um, getting her coffee, spending time in God's word, sending me what she's learning. And it's just so life-changing for me to have a woman of faith like that in my life. Um, And in purchasing this journal, it changed my life. I don't take too long, but I I spend time in God's word because it's it's like the glasses that helps me see. It's the framework for my day. My prayer journal is a tool for me to eliminate the distractions of our day-to-day lives. 
and just spend some quality time with God. It's a way that I set my mind on the things above. And I've been uh, talking about some different ways to apply this challenge of setting our minds on the things above. We just have so many potential distractions on our day-to-day lives. We have work, classes, homework, eating in the, uh, an alpha, social media, hall events, campus events, the joust, and just so much more. But this is all the more reason for us to be making time for God so that we can set our minds on the things above. But why? You might be asking why, Logan. Why should we set our mind on the things above? Like, what is, what, how does that benefit me? And I would say because God is love. He's, God is peace. God is fulfillment. And God is time. And just so, so much more. And when we set our minds on the things above, it allows us to reflect him. It allows us to mirror him. And so we've just seen one way that we can love God with all of our mind. How? Because we must set our minds on the things above. So now we're about to look at the second way of how we can love God with all of our mind. And it's that we must renew our mind. Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but, by, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And I was like, what, is that, what does that look like? What does that mean? I, I need some more. And so um, a source that I found, it says, The mind is the key to the Christian life. The gospel is the call for the unbeliever to repent of his sins and embrace Christ by faith. The Greek word translated repentance carries the notion of a change of mind, a 180, in fact. Our thinking must be changed or transformed from our old ungodly ways into a new godly way of thinking. But how can we look like Christ if we're filling ourselves up with the world? 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love this world or the things it offers you, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. And I think that verse is just so crucial in the fact that we need to control what comes in and out of our mind because the renewal of our mind is so much worth it. Who, by a show of hands, who's heard of the saying, you are what you eat? Thank you. (laughs) But what if we apply that to our minds, right? What if we apply that to our minds? We are what we eat, whether that's what we feed ourselves. What are, what, 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 what's up, what's up? Okay. <laughs> what if we apply that to our minds, right? What we see on TikTok, what we see on Instagram, what the shows we watch, the people that we support, things of that nature. I think that it's crucial that we know that the, re- the renewing of our minds is a daily thing. But how does someone renew their mind, and why do they renew their mind? Well, I think renewing our mind could look like this. Going down by the lake and reading scripture. Maybe it's singing a a worship song in the shower, because it's a proven fact that everyone's a better singer in the shower. That's just facts. Don't argue with me, it's the truth. (laughs) Uh, Maybe it's waking up early, uh, which if you're like me, it's gross. Um, But coffee and Jesus, great combination. Um, Maybe it's going on a walk, listening to a podcast sitting down in jazz bus and watching a sermon, taking notes. The possibilities are endless of how we experience God. But why? Right? Why, why do we do this? I have two reasons on why we renew our mind, why we should. Because we do it to discern God's will. That last part of Romans 12, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable and perfect. But I think we also do it because of 2 Corinthians 10.5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And I think that just shows that we have to see if our thoughts go against God or if they affirm God's word. We have to see if it goes against God's word or if it confirms God's word. I went over, I had the privilege of going over to Lonnie Anderson's house uh, for Easter, and so I got to to sit down and have a conversation with him, and I was like, hey, Lonnie, what does, what does it look like? What does it look like to love God with all your mind? And um, he said, 
I think that our lives would be so much different if we gave God control of our minds. If God can access our minds, if God can control our minds, if he can control our temptation, our words, our actions, how we love others, the feelings, he can use access to everything. I think that's so important because I feel like we have a hard time letting God be in control because we like being in control. We like being the lowercase lords of ourselves. And it's not that the voices of distractions are louder, but sometimes we simply just don't like what God's saying because it charges us. It stirs something up inside of us, and it makes us have to do something. For example, words like forgive them, let it go, move on, or even a, a simple no. And so I have this illustration um, that I think is very helpful. I think this is just really crucial to how we understand our minds. So we have this this vase here, right? We're going to let that represent uh, the vessel of our mind. And so we have these orange ping pong balls here, and they're going to represent the thoughts um, of our day-to-day life. And I think, you know, what we fill our mind is very, what we fill our mind up with is very crucial So things like the music we listen to, the shows we watch, that thought went away. Okay, well, (laughs) that's tough. (laughs) That is tough. Okay, well, the shows we watch, what we say, what we we pour into ourselves, right? And so we fill our mind up with these things, maybe some lies here and there. Uh, Maybe another ping pong ball will fall out, we'll see. But we fill our mind up with these thoughts. Right? Maybe, maybe it's even thoughts that sound like, I'm not worth it. Right? Why would, why would God love someone like me? I don't deserve to go and speak here. I don't deserve to be here. Right? Um, and I think that we just fill our mind up with the lies of this world. Maybe it's songs that are like, maybe if I just looked like this, or if I had all this money, and I can do this and do that, then maybe I'll be worth the effort. Maybe I'll do something with my life, right? And so we fill our minds up with all these lies, with what the world tells us, right? So what do we do? Our mind is full, right? Our mind is full of these of these thoughts, um, of these lies, right? What do we What do we do? We have to we have to do something, right? Something has to happen. I think it's intentional action. Intentional action. How do, how do you know what your friend sounds like if you don't spend time with them, if you don't know what they sound like? Like, for example, Jody. I love Jody. Jody's out there somewhere. <laughs> Hi, Jody. <laughs> I know you're out there. I know, see, I know Jody. I know her voice. I, I hear her across campus sometimes. I love you, Jody. Hope you know I'm not coming at you. <laughs> but I know a friend's voice because I've spent time with her, because I know. I got to know her. The same thing applies to God. When we fill our mind up with God's living water and who he says we are, and who he says we are, it's this crazy thing. These thoughts, right? If we start meditating on God's word, what he says, um, that his grace, that his power is made sufficient in our weakness, right? We start meditating on who God is. These, oh, that thought went away too. <laughs> right? So we get filled up, right? We fill our minds up with what God has for us because <laughs> because these thoughts, right? We think that, that if we have money, it'll make our problems go away. We think that if we can just work and work and work, then we'll be okay. And God's like, my, my power is made sufficient in your weakness. Grace College, please hear me say that. His power is made perfect in our weakness. And and here we are, right, filled up with the Holy Spirit. 
filled up, filling our minds up with things that are the things on a, the things that are above. And how amazing is it that we can operate like that? Um, and so, uh, as we wrap up here, we just saw two ways today that we can love God with all of our mind. The first one being that we must set our minds on the things that are above. And the second way was that we must renew our minds. Um, and I think that it's important to note that when we set our minds on the things above, it leads to the renewal of our mind. It's not a, it's not a one and a one thing. It's a one, two. And so um, I just really would like to thank you guys for listening. Um, but I do think that it's important to not only, um, you know, sit here in chapel, listen to God's word being preached, um, have amazing worship, but to also live it out. Um, so Elijah's going to come on the stage and talk about the uh, next the next opportunity that we have to put that into practice. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Logan. Uh, can we give it up for Logan one more time? That was just awesome. Yeah. All right. So I, uh, I signed up for the most fun activity of the day. Um, so I'm going to walk you through. So if you have a paper bag, um, you should have gotten one when you came in. If you don't, I would like you to raise your hand, jump up and down, scream and shout for joy because I have some chapel team members that would love to get you one. Um, if you have one already, I want you to go ahead and reach in there. Um, and hopefully you guys recognize this. This is a tub of Play-Doh. This is the best thing ever. Um, I love Play-Doh. I think this is the coolest stuff on the u in the universe. Um, so yeah. Um, all right. Now, the next thing that I would like for you to do is to, uh, so you should grab your Play-Doh, and then you should look around, and you should grab a friend. Those are also good to have for this activity that we're doing, all right? Awesome. As we just heard from Logan on loving God with our minds, um, we want to kind of bring it into a little bit more focus. Um, and I want you guys to um, listen to Philippians 4, verse 8. It says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Logan just shared with us all of these distractions and these lies that we tell ourselves. Um, and I think that all of us can relate to that. And so my challenge for you is if you will uh, open up your Play-Doh, I want you to think of a story or of a thing or of whatever it may be of something that distracts you, something that keeps you away, keeps your mind away from loving God. Okay, and then I want you to share briefly with your partner, with your friend, uh, what that thing is. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do that, uh, and then I will hop right back over here, and I will give you some more instructions. distraction or something something that you can relate to that distracts you in your hand made out of play-doh right so now 
I want you to do a really practical thing with me, okay? I want you to take that Play-Doh in your hand, and I want you to smash it. Smash those distractions. Yeah. I just hear it all around. This is like the greatest sound ever. All right. Thank you. Now I want you to think back to this verse, and I want you to think of something true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, something that has excellence or is worthy of praise. And I want you to start making something there with your Play-Doh, if you will. Uh, Share with your partner, share with your friends around you. Creatively uh, thinking about these these things that are above, um, and, and I want to I want to leave you with this wonderful little challenge. Um, your mind is just as malleable as the Play-Doh in your hands, and the things that you allow to mess with it, to touch it, to control it, um, that will continue to impact you and your thoughts and your life. So once again, I'm just going to read Philippians 4, 8, and I want you to kind of dwell on that, and then we're going to go back into a time of worship. Um, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Thanks, guys. As we're pondering that and thinking about that, we'd love for you to stand and join us as we continue in music.
let that be true of our minds, of our hearts. Lord, remind us that our chief end is to enjoy you and to serve you. Being in relationship with you is the best place that we can be 
for ourselves or the people around us. It's what we were designed for. Lord, let our lives align more and more with the calling that you placed on us to worship, to love you well. And that starts with growing deeper and deeper, being rooted in your love for us. Let us continue to understand that, God, we will fail always consistently while we're on this earth, in this life. But God, let our eyes be constantly turning towards you. No matter how many times our eyes move away from you, God, let us always turn them back to you. Draw our hearts towards you, even as we enter this time of teaching. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know how many of you remember last semester, we had a phenomenal chapel where we had Nikki Lerner join us um, and Wally and the team, and they put on a phenomenal time of worship and teaching for us. And we have the opportunity to participate in that again this morning. Um, Nikki is a podcaster, she is a speaker, she is an artist, and she has some phenomenal things to share with us in her reflection. I have been so blessed um, by hearing her teaching and her music, and she just has so much to share with us, and we are really excited to welcome her this morning, so join me in welcoming her. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Good. I feel so sad because I was looking for Hot Dog Man. Y'all remember Hot Dog Man last time we were here? (laughs) They're like, how was Grace Chapel? I'm like, all I remember was there was a hot dog man, like, sitting right over there. Is he here? I don't even know if he's here. Hey, good to see you. (laughs) Nice to see you again, my friend. Cool. All right, Kennedy, just stay there for a minute. Don't be scared. Okay. Um, And can you grab that music stand for me? Welcome to a tall girl's world. Can't even see my Bible right now. Just can't even see my Bible. (laughs) Thanks. I always tell the Brath family I'm glad to be around them because they're all like Amazons. I feel like I'm with my people. All right, so I want to start this way. Everybody just take a deep breath in. Take a deep breath in. Now let it out. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Let it out. Good. How many of you um, really felt connected to that last song that you sang? What was it called, Kennedy? Fade Away. Y'all, how many of you feel connected? It's okay if you don't. It's okay. But how many of you do, right, that like moves you in something? I was thinking as we were singing that song, you ever sit in worship sometimes and feel like you're lying? I know nobody really wants to admit that, right? But do you ever feel like you sing things that you don't mean? I, I have. Because let me tell you, we, we sing some really powerful things, don't we? Like, like for instance, um, Kip, you guys in the back, can you bring up that first verse? Okay, let's look at these words for a minute. Speak to me. You are the only voice I want to hear. Come on now. <laughs> Kennedy, where's your microphone? Right? Is this your microphone here? Can you just sing it? Just sing it a cappella. And sing it slow. Don't rush it. Okay. Okay. Hey, when you got a good singer in the room, you make her go slow. <laughs> Thank you. So go ahead, go ahead, Kennedy, sing that for us. Speak to me. You're the only voice I want to hear. Woo. All right. Okay. Mm-hmm. I might keep you up here the whole time. <laughs> it's like, sing that verse again, Kennedy. <laughs> 
Okay, so that was lovely, right? And you all sang it so lovely. And yet, there were probably like 60% of you that were still checking Facebook while you were singing that. Come on, be honest. In the moment, like, is that really true? Is the voice of God, the voice of, of the Spirit, really the only voice you want to hear? Like, come on. How many of you are willing to be honest that a lot of times that ain't true? Come on, raise your hand. Thank God. Thank you for being honest, okay? Because <laughs> quite frankly, sometimes you're probably like, no, leave me alone. <laughs> All right? You're, you're, you're like both, right? You're like both. You're like, speak to me, Jesus. And then Jesus is like, okay, here's what I got to say. And you're like, no, 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 too much. <laughs> no, 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 no. I meant, I meant tomorrow. All right? Okay, what's, uh, cycle through the next line for me, guys. Okay, walk with me. Show me who you are. As a, nah, nah, not that one. Okay, give me another one. <laughs> Ooh, okay, this is a good one. <laughs> this is my favorite. When I heard y'all sing this, I was like, ooh, that's a good one. If you're not in it, then I don't want it. <laughs> ah, okay, uh, Kennedy, go ahead and sing that one for us. Remember, sing it slow. Go sing it slow. If you're not in it, then I don't want it. Ooh, that's good. One more time. I just want to hear it again. <laughs> if you're not in it, then I don't want it. Good. Now you guys sing it. Go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh -huh. If I don't want it. Good, 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 good. Hmm. If you're not in it, then I don't want it. Really? Okay. If you're not in it, I don't want it. Ooh, that's isn't that deep? How do you sing that all the time? How do you lead that song, Kennedy? That God will make it true in that's my right. heart. <laughs> you're like, Lord, I'm lying, but please make it true today. Help my unbelief. <laughs> right? If you're not in it, then I don't want it. Okay. I think that's it, Kennedy. I think that's it. Okay. Can you just be on deck in case I need you again? Yeah, God bless you. Okay, good. Thanks, Kennedy. Yeah. And thank you, Kip. Appreciate that. If you're not in it, then I don't want it. I only know some people that follow Jesus that actually live like that. And it's weird because sometimes, I don't know about you guys and who you're surrounded by, but a lot of times people that live like that and they live that outward, we're, we're kind of like, wow, that gosh is really spiritual. They're really committed to Jesus. Or we use big like christian -y terms like, they're so anointed. That's my favorite churchy phrase. They're so anointed. Like everybody else is not. Don't you hate when you hear stuff like that? Like, oh, John is so anointed. And then you got like, Caleb on the side, like, what about me? You know, nobody saw me play the bass today, all right? <laughs> like, we use all these phrases and all these terminologies, and we say things sometimes that we don't mean. Now, in worship, right, probably like me, you're hoping, like, you're singing things. You're, you're being prophetic, right? You are singing into being what you want and what you desire, okay? So I'm using this to try to make a point, right? So you, you're, you're singing what you long to be, right, in worship. You don't have to have it perfect. You don't have to believe it all the time. The point is, is that it's focused on God and that it's authentic, right? But sometimes in our worship songs, there is so much depth and so much declaration. And it goes by so fast during a worship song that after it's over, you forget what you just sung. And then what happens is a lot of times we end up going right out the door and living just like we were living before we came in and had an experience with Jesus. If you had an experience with worship, if you had experience with the words, when you come into chapel, hopefully, then when you walk out the door and you start to go back into uh, everyday life, that you should feel changed by it. But so often we don't. And I want to talk about what, what is the missing 
piece of that? What is the missing piece between what we sing and what we declare and then how we live? Because I know a lot of people who follow Jesus, and they may sing, if you're not in it, I don't want it, or however it goes. Uh, but I think that's how it goes. I was saying somebody else's song. I don't remember. But if, right, if you're not in it, I don't want it. A lot of times what happens is Jesus is like, no, I'm in it all. And we're like, yeah, but I'll take a little bit of that and a little bit of that. I don't think I want any of that. Even if you're in it. Maybe a better way to sing it would be like, if you're kind of in it, I'm not sure I want it. That might be, maybe that's a little more true. I don't know. Because I know some things, the things that I, I see Jesus in very strongly is exactly the stuff I don't want to do. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> right? Even though at the same time I'm praying, God, would you just use me? Use me, Lord. Anybody pray like that? Anybody? Come on, raise your hand. Anybody pray like that? Great. Me and six other people. Good. So we're trying to be the spiritual ones, right? But you're like, God, use me, use me, use me. And I think every single day, God is putting opportunities in front of us, and we're like, nah, not that one. You're like, God, call me to be a missionary, Lord. And, 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 and God's like, yes, go to the African sub-Sahara desert. And you're like, no, I was saying, call me to San Diego, Lord. Jesus, call me to Hawaii. Lord, I want to suffer for you in Hawaii, Hallelujah. You know, you start getting your spiritual language and stuff. You're like, Jesus, Hawaii, <laughs> right? But a lot of things, now, Jesus is in things like that. He is, because he's in everything, and he's in the stuff that's hard. There are places in your life right now that God is telling you to go. There is a way of being right now and who you are as a person that Jesus is saying, you need to change. And while many of us are singing, if you're not in it, I don't want it. At the same time, we're like, nope, I'm good. I'm just going to sit over here on Instagram for a while. What is the missing piece? So I want to take you to the scripture. Matthew chapter 22. I know you've been hearing about other portions of the scripture. I'm going to read the context of it, and then we're going to focus on the last piece of it. Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, all right? So if you've got a Bible app, you can follow along with me, or just find the one that's your favorite. The point is, is that you understand it, period, okay? Don't ever, just a side note, don't ever read a Bible translation that you don't understand, because the, the point of reading scripture is not for uh, you to get through the scriptures. It's for it to get through you. So make sure that you can understand it. Okay? Very, very important. All right, so check this out. Verse 36. These are the uh, uppity, bougie, religious people talking to Jesus. The scripture actually says that. No, it doesn't. Okay, verse 36. This is what they, what they ask Jesus. Teacher. Which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Now, remember, they didn't really want to know. They were trying to trap Jesus to use something against him, okay? Verse 37, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, verse 39, a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then it ends in verse 40. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. I want to focus on verse 39. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you think we're doing a good job of this as churchy Jesus people? We think, yes? 
Now, how many say, yes, we're, doing, we're awesome. We're knocking it out of the park. Anybody? It's okay if you do, if you're that one person. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> how many of you are kind of like, eh, we're in the middle. Sometimes we're all right. Sometimes we need some help. Anybody? Yeah, I'm kind of like that too. How many of you are like, I don't even know what's going on right now. Who are we? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. Some of you all are just too scared to answer. Okay, that's all right. So love your neighbor as yourself. Hmm. So if we're not doing a good job or we're doing a medium job of loving others, then what does that say about the way we love ourselves? You ever thought about that? If we're not doing a great job about loving our neighbor, what does that say about how we love ourselves? Just something I want you to think about, and I want you to think about it deeply. Because usually, people preach this passage, or you may be in a church setting, and what they focus on is loving the neighbor, right? Loving the neighbor. Here's how to love other people. Here's how you do it. Make sure you do it. But oftentimes, the missing piece is, yeah, but it says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Girl, it's fine. It's, you, go, you all right? Go ahead and pick it up. It's okay. <laughs> hey, I got you. It's all good. <laughs> That's okay. I'm a creative person, so I was like, squirrel, you know, like that. <laughs> so it's fine. You don't have to be embarrassed. I'm good. But think about that for a minute. When, when's the last time you've heard a, a sermon entitled, How to Love You? Today, we're going to talk about how to love yourself. Some of you are like, finally. <laughs> finally, they're starting to get it around here, right? But most of us, particularly in church and Christian context, we're actually taught the opposite, aren't we? We're taught, don't think about yourself too much. Right? Is that what you guys get to? Like, is, how many sermons have you heard that say, it's not about you? Oh, my God, if I hear one more sermon that says, it's not about me. How many of those, how many times can you actually hear a message that says it's not about you? It's not about you. It's not about you. Chew. <laughs> it's not about you. It's not about y'all. It's not about you. It's not about you. But then the scriptures say, hey, make sure when you love people, you love them like you love you. Well, apparently, if I have a belief about myself that I don't love myself and that it's not about me, apparently that means it's not about them either. And maybe that's why we're having such a hard time these days trying to love people. Because there are some people out there claiming that they are loving people in Jesus' name, and I'm like, I don't want that love. You can keep that love. Don't love me like that. And here's the thing, if you don't know how to love yourself first, how are you supposed to know how to love other people? Because doesn't the scripture say, love your neighbor as you love yourself? So if you don't, <laughs> yeah, I see you. So if you don't love yourself, how then are you supposed to love your neighbor? Just something to think about today. There are some of you that if you were honest, if there could be a microphone inside of your head, the way that you talk to yourself on a daily basis, you wouldn't talk that way to your best friend. The way that you talk to yourself when you mess up or you do something wrong or you don't meet an expectation the messaging in your head, you would never say that to somebody that you love. How many of you, every time you mess up, you're like, oh, I'm such an idiot. Thank you, thank you. 
right? Oh, that was a dumb thing to do. Oh, so dumb. Oh, like I don't have anything good to say. Ah, no, no, I don't have any gifts. Like who talks to people that way? So here's the thing. If that's the way you think you're loving yourself, I don't want that love. You see what I'm getting at? I don't want that way that you think you love yourself. Sometimes that's the disconnect that we're having with loving people, that we have not taken the time to honor ourselves first so that we even know what it looks like to honor other people. Some of you are so mean to yourself. Some of you are so disappointed in yourself. Some of you talk to yourself like a drill sergeant, particularly if you play sports here, (laughs) right? But some of you talk to yourself like a drill sergeant. No grace, no love, all shame. How are you supposed to then look outside of yourself and love other people? According to the scripture, you can't do it. Or the same love or lack of love that you are giving to yourself, that is what you will give and offer to other people. So think about this. The next time you either see someone else or you have a lack of love for somebody else. If you talk, bless you, if you talk to yourself, if you, if you talk to yourself like this, oh, I'm such an idiot, and somebody outside of you says something that either you don't agree with or makes you mad, and then you turn it into, you're such an idiot. Where do you think that comes from? It's got to originate somewhere. I think a better way to think about this scripture in 2022 is how about you love yourself so you can love your neighbor? Bless you. Do you hear what I said? How about you learn to love yourself so that you can then love your neighbor? I was in pastoral ministry for a long time. I pastored, um, I was one of the pastors at a church of about 5,000 people, 52 different nations represented. Beautiful, gorgeous church. And I remember that I was loving this place where I was, I was loving it. I was loving leading, I was loving leading people, all of that, right? And there still felt like there was something missing. And there was a, a preacher that showed up to our church and he started telling his own story about after a while, everything was about everybody else all the time. Because that was the messaging. Your life is about other people all the time, right? That's the messaging. It's not bad. But don't forget that you get to be a part of that love and that community as well. And I remember thinking to myself as a leader, oh my gosh, like I have been, I have felt like a robot. Because every time I felt something deeply, every time I wanted to do something, I just push it off like it doesn't matter. Anybody ever do that? Right? Because you're like, well, it's about everybody else. Let me serve everybody else. And I sat with a mentor, and the mentor said to me, you need to spend some time caring for yourself like you care for other people. And I was terrified because as a Christian person, I was like, but doesn't that mean I'm going to be selfish? Anybody ever have that? Like, you're like, I don't want to spend too much time on me because next thing you know, it's going to be all about me. I want to tell you that when I focused on myself, it was actually the most selfless thing I ever did. Because what happened was when I started to love myself more, the love that I had by the time I went out into the world to serve other people was full. I stepped outside the door in fullness, not in neediness. I stepped out to really serve people not needing a thank you, not needing a, hey, good job, Julie, you know, not needing any of that, right? 
if you don't know how to love yourself, if you don't have the practice of loving yourself, it is going to be really hard for you to learn how to love your neighbor, people who are close to you, others that you interact with. God says to us in scripture that we are loved. God, God says, uh, I love what Jesus says in John 15. He says, uh, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Man, I love that scripture. You didn't choose me. I chose you. The scripture goes on and on and on all over the Bible about how much we are loved by God. And yet, we can sometimes show up and sing Speak to me, you're the only voice I want to hear, unless you tell me that you love me. Because when you tell me you love me, when you tell me how beautiful I am, when you tell me how gifted I am, when you tell me how much I matter in this world, I don't want to hear that. Because all I got space for, Lord, is shame and guilt and the way I talk to myself. But trust me. If you are practicing that in your everyday life, that is exactly what you will offer to the world around you. If you think in one breath you can be nasty to yourself and then go out and love an unbelieving world that doesn't think like you, you are kidding yourself. I don't know about you, I'm not that good. To just turn it on, turn it off, right? Like I don't love myself, but I'm like, oh, I'm a loving person in the world. Mm-mm. Doesn't work like that. So God says... Love your neighbor as yourself. And don't forget, don't forget to ask people how you want them, you to love them. Don't assume, <laughs> don't assume, ask people. How would, it feel, how would you feel loved today? What can I do for you that would show you love? Go ask people. Don't assume that you know what people need all the time. Go ask them. And then what happens is, as you've developed the practice of loving who you are first, you start there from that center, then you can navigate in an unbelieving world trying to love people with light. So, love yourself so you can love your neighbor. Trust me, if you start to love you, you will not go into selfishness. I think most of you probably love Jesus too much for that. So trust yourself, trust the spirit inside of you. You're not gonna fall off the cliff of selfishness. You're not gonna do that. But what you will find is fullness in Christ, and then a fullness and love for yourself. I'm gonna invite the band to come up and join me, because I'm gonna sing something for you, if that's okay. If it's not, I'm sorry, because that's the plan. Uh, that's all we got. <laughs> but here's the thing I want you to consider. You, all of you in this room probably know someone close to you that does not do well at loving themselves. Check out the fruit of a life of the people that don't love themselves well. Just if, as a practice, not as a judgment, as a practice. Go look and write down five things that you see in people around you that you know do not love themselves well. What do you see? And then ask yourself, do I want that? Is that the kind of person I want to be? I mean, if it is, then go, go ahead. <laughs> That's your choice. But at least ask yourself the question. What could it look like if every single day you started with, how do I honor myself first before I try to go out and honor other people?
How do I try to love myself first before I try to go out and serve and try to act like I can love other people? You go first. You practice on yourself. Don't expect it from the world around you if you're not willing to do it yourself. That would be just inauthentic. And people in your world that rub up against you the wrong way, that maybe are even mean to you or say stuff behind your back or that kind of thing, I guarantee you they don't love themselves. <laughs> I guarantee you. Because when you are focused on how do I love who God has created, you don't need to cut anybody else down. You don't need to say nasty things about other people. You don't need to do that because you enter the world full full and ready to serve other people. It's time, y'all. We got to go. We need to stop playing around. There are people in darkness. Some of you in this room, if you admit it, you're in darkness. And the people sitting around you, they don't love themselves, so they don't even know how to serve you. We got to stop playing around, y'all. God has designed you for such a time as this. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter. You're ready. <laughs> or you're not ready, but it doesn't matter. You're never ready. God is leading you somewhere. So you go first. Love yourself so that you can love your neighbor. You deserve to be a beneficiary of your own giftedness. Some of you are really beautiful uh, servers. Some of you love your friends really well. And my challenge to those of you that do that well is allow your gifts to serve you too. If you're a great encourager, don't forget to encourage yourself. If you serve people well, don't forget to serve yourself. You matter too. All right? Y'all with me? Y'all with me? Okay. I hope that was a good way to spend time. <laughs> um, so I'm going to sing this song. And as we're singing, I just want you to take a minute to consider your own life. And I want to encourage you, you know, um, try not to zone out if you can't. And I don't even care if you're looking at your phone or watching Facebook as long as you're listening. <laughs> Right? But what I do want you to do is I want you to think about your own life. How do you love yourself better so that you can love other people? All right, fellas, let's do it. I'll meet you at the end. is 
to be with you. Thanks. Hey guys. My name is Jacob and I get to the opportunity to introduce our last activity. Um, that's not very right. So, um, but I want to give you a brief story about how loving your neighbor is important. So, with a little brief story of my life. So 
Most of you know that I'm from Thailand and have cerebral palsy. But only a select few know my struggle to love my neighbor, which in this case was and is my birth mom. I never really thought about my childhood and trauma growing up, because, let alone the damage that my birth mother caused me. Because I blamed myself for giving her up. But the simple truth is that there were circumstances unknown on why she gave me up. And that's just like, there is no reconciliation for that. So one of my favorite quotes comes actually from The Lion King, where Rafiki, the wise monkey, kind of gives some of this advice before he goes back to Pride Rock to save his um, family. He says, yes, the past can't hurt, but the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. It's, this par it's powerful because so often we naturally run away from our problems and don't want to deal with the hard stuff, and that's exactly what I did. I went several years without dealing with my trauma, and it wasn't until this year when I faced it. I took to dealing with my trauma through writing a poem at 2 a.m. I was listening to this song, and the artist said, the person you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Please leave a message. Once I heard that, it finally clicked. How I could love my neighbor even if I could never see her face to face. Our goal for this time today is to give you guys this opportunity to write a letter to a person who you need to forgive or you need to ask God for forgiveness for that person. You will find a piece of paper and a pen in your bag. But before we do that, I would like to share my poem with you. So I know that uh, writing this paper or this letter, it's hard and you don't really want to run back, but the important thing is that you need to deal with it in order to love yourself. Um, so my encouragement is that you ask God to unlock that path for you. So I'm gonna read this poem. This poem is called, Please Leave a Message. And it's too high. All right. It, hey, it's your son, who you left at the hospital under the sun. You left him grasping for life because of circumstances unknown. He only knew that he was forgotten in front of his eyes. That much was known. Hey, it's your son, who got placed in the orphanage where teaching oneself had begun because of the absence of a role model. Nurture, what's that? He taught himself how to cuddle. Hey, it's your son, who is left scared of the world where he learned to be vigilant because of the lack of supervision. A hey, mother, what's that? He grew up indifferent. Hey, it's your son, who crawled to get around where he learned a tough life lesson because there on the floor he was found. Normal, what's that? He left his usefulness. Hey, it's your son, who got handpicked where he got scared to be accepted because he watched others be chosen. Love, what's that? He became disconnected. Hey, it's your son, who moved to a better place because where he experienced family shock because they expected him to embrace. Family, what's that? He put up a wall just in case. Hey, Mom, it's Jacob. I have vowed to understand where I had to figure out the unknown, because I was left at the hospital to stand. You left me on my own. Peace, what's that? I have fought alone. Hey, Mom, it's Jacob. I was placed in the orphanage where I was taught resilience because there was no remodel. You were inexperienced. Trust, what's that? I became the remodel. Hey, Mom, it's Jacob. I was scared of the world where I learned to adapt because I knew I wasn't getting entrapped. Strength, what's that? He grew different. Hey, Mom, it's Jacob. I got surgery so I could waddle, where I learned true freedom because I am not bound to the floor. Normal, what's that? He left, how awful. Hey, Mom, it's Jacob. I got handpicked where I learned what, who God is because I learned the bigger picture. Salvation, what's that? He saved me through scripture. Hey, Mom, it's Jacob. I moved to a better place because I, where I became someone because I learned about grace. Christianity, what's that? He rescues everyone. Hey, Mom, it's Jacob. I forgive because I understand these circumstances unknown. I can't do much but forget that much I know. 
my mom. So yeah, I just want you guys to take some time and uh, either write a poem if you so choose, and there'll be a slide up on the screen. Um,
We're going to sing a song that we can sing collectively. Um, and as you're finishing up, some of you are pro- might be in a really deep place. Something sparked um, the exercise that Jacob invited you into. So take your time. We're going to start this song. Hopefully you'll know some of it. And then just, you can stand or sit, whatever you want, but just engage when you're ready, okay? Whatever you need to do. Some of you, you need to just sit on the floor somewhere. Go ahead and sit on the floor. Like, if you're uncomfortable right now, don't be uncomfortable and worship. (laughs) All right? Find your space. Do you. Okay? So we're going to sing. Remember that Jesus wants you to serve out of your fullness, not your emptiness. Serve out of your fullness, not your emptiness. He is full in you. Let's do it. Digno es santo el cordero
Jesus, Jesus, your name is power. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and love, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourselves, you know. The speakers today have given us a lot to think about. I think for me, I think back to Ray when he spoke and how God pursu- God's pursuit and love of us is there even when our pursuit and love of him isn't. For Logan, you know, reflecting on loving God with our minds by filling our minds with what God says is true and good to push out the lies that are so easy to believe. And Nikki, it wasn't, I don't think, part of what you were planning to say, but I, my mind got stuck on this. You know, the whole, like, God used me, right? Like, God used me to love my neighbor, but not that neighbor. I want a different neighbor. Can you give me an easier neighbor to love? So just thinking on those things and chewing on those things, some I want to go after after today with and, and, and continue to think about and reflect on. And I'm sure some things stuck with you, so don't, don't leave them here. Take them with you. Keep reflecting on them. Keep thinking on them and, and talk about them in, over lunch or in the dorms. All right, real quick. Tomorrow's chapel, uh, we have Dr. Floria. She is both a medical professional and has been the seven-time professor of the year in professor, as a professor and instructor at University of Southern California and Loma Linda. She also happens to be Dr. Rotz's cousin. So if we're lucky, we'll get at least one funnier and embarrassing story about him. All right, we can hope for that. We can hope for that. It's come tomorrow to find out. This afternoon, we're going to transition to lunch and then to Communitas. We've invited Dr. Lauren Rich to give us a heads up about some of those details about lunch and what's going on this afternoon. So, Dr. Lauren Rich. Good morning, Grace. And it is a good morning. I don't know how you were feeling when you came in this morning. When I came in, it was raining, and I felt like it was raining. And I'm happy to tell you that the sun is out now. And... And it's a really good thing because we've got a lot of fun stuff going on today. So a couple of announcements. First of all, the joust begins today. I hear Jenna Meyer is bringing her A-game for the lettuce eating competition. Um, If you signed up for a joust t-shirt, please find your team captains at the following locations. Red and green are the upper concourse entrance and yellow and blue are the lower entrance. You can also pick up your shirt in the involvement office today until five or tomorrow until four. After 4 p.m. tomorrow, I think all bets are off and if you didn't request a shirt, you can still go by and pick one up if there are leftovers. Also, this afternoon is Communitas. This is Grace's annual celebration of faith and scholarship. This is our first fully in-person Communitas following COVID, so we are really excited about that. Yay. And we start off with a picnic lunch. 
the wonderful weather over here. So please, after you're dismissed from day of worship, have your ID ready. Head to Alpha Patio for, to pick up your picnic lunch. We've also got a, a tent set up on Morgan Library lawn with some tables and chairs. You can sit outside if you'd like. Um, and then starting at 1.30, we have got student presentations in the Science Center. Uh, at 1.30 and at 2.45, they are gonna be on topics ranging from seeing God from the lens of a microscope to, I kid you not, do you hate your classes? Something about teaching styles at Grace College. There will also be free cookies over there. And then from 4 to 5 p.m. this afternoon, the Morgan Library Lawn Tent Ink Spot Party. So you can pick up your free copy of the literary magazine. And I believe Jacob's poem is in it. Yes. Um, so you can get your free copy of the literary magazine. You can also get a free made-to-order espresso drink. Um, we'll have some other fun things for you to do. And you can uh, uh, enjoy the beautiful weather um, at the Ink Spot Party. I think those are all the announcements. All right, let me pray for our lunch and then we will be dismissed. God, we thank you that you loved us first. We thank you that you set your heart on us, that you have loved us and you have loved us into loving you. God, continue to stir our hearts to love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind. And may we more fully understand what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves. And God, may we make the most of every opportunity you give us to show your love. God, we thank you for this meal that we're about to enjoy. Thank you for how you provide for us each and every day. We thank you most of all for how you provided for us in Jesus. We thank you for him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Go love God, love others. Enjoy lunch. Go to Communitas. Get your t-shirts. Have a good day.